Welcome to this webinar series on PARP inhibitor in ovarian cancer. Today I'm going to uh, host a roundtable discussion about the prescribing and utility and usage of PARP inhibitors in ovarian cancer. My name is Dr. Robert Coleman. I am a professor in the Department of Gynecologic Oncology and Reproductive Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And I'm joined here with three of my esteemed colleagues to discuss this topic in great depth. I'd like to introduce my panel. Uh, and first, let me start with you, Casey. Thank you. Uh, I'm Casey Williams, and I am the Chief Scientific Officer and also Director of our Phase One program at Avera Cancer Institute in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Thanks for having me. Hi, my name is Judith Smith. I'm an Associate Professor in the Division of Gynecologic Oncology in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences at the UT Health McGovern Medical School here in Houston and also practice at the Memorial Hermann Cancer Center in Women's Cancers. Really happy to be here today to discuss the PARP inhibitors. Thank you, welcome. Laura? Hi, my name is Laura Alwyn and I'm an oncology clinical pharmacist at the University of Washington Medical Center and the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance in Seattle, Washington. And I practice predominantly in the women's uh, cancer and specialty clinics. And I'm really happy to be here, thanks. Welcome, thank you all. Thank you, thank pleased you. to have you here. So I'd like to open this dialogue um, to provide a little background about where uh, these really important drugs are now being used in the management of patients with ovarian cancer by starting out with a little bit of the natural history of this disease. And there's some really unique aspects to ovarian cancer I think that are probably underappreciated. You know, if you open up a textbook, you always kind of see the statistics, mm -hmm. 20,000 cases a year, 14,000 deaths. But I think that really under um, represents what the real clinical burden is. And I like to refer to that as what the prevalence of this disease is. Mm -hmm. So as we all know, um, the instance rates are the number of new cases that are presenting at any, one, at any one time point. In the prevalence, we're talking about the number of women in the United States who have this disease. Mm -hmm. And then we've learned that as our treatments are becoming more effective, we're having we're seeing patients who are undergoing more lines of therapy for longer durations of time. And so what we're seeing is a swell of the prevalence of, of, of uh, cases of ovarian cancer. And what's I think, and I'm trying to get this data to uh, really cleanly, but I've been tracking it just kind of internally. We've seen about a 30% increase in the prevalence despite the fact that incidence is actually declining. So it's kind of interesting. And part of that story is around this new class of drugs. So I'm really pleased to be able to to share this, um, this information with our, with our audience and uh, to engage with them in the question and answer session. Now one factor just to kind of um, provide the overview of ovarian cancer management is we all know that patients on the, uh, after diagnosis usually are approached for both uh, a surgical and chemotherapy as a, as a primary treatment regimen. In the United States, there's, whether the surgery comes first or after an induction phase of chemotherapy is still kind of um, controversial, and, but there are definitely patients for which both of these approaches are valid, and at least from the phase three study, studies that are uh, available to us, we see that the outcomes are relatively similar uh, for those approaches. Following that therapy, it's kind of becomes very unknown. We know that patients that finish chemotherapy um, oftentimes um, would like to stop treatment, but we know that the likelihood that the, that the tumor will come back in advanced stage patients is actually quite high. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of primary maintenance has been really important for us to investigate, and we have. We've done more than 15 randomized phase three trials in this space, mm -hmm. and we've not been able to show that that type of therapy actually improves overall survival, although we're seeing PFS. Mm -hmm. So it's very exciting that in that space, that box, maintenance, primary maintenance, we now see an explosion of new strategies that are focused on angiogenesis inhibitors, PARP inhibitors, mm -hmm. uh, immune oncology agents, and then all of the combinations, mm -hmm. the two, 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 and three. Mm -hmm. Following that, we know that most patients on the average have about, or I should say on the median, have about a 16 to 24, 26 month progression-free survival. So the majority of the patients who do recur, unfortunately, are recur with platinum-sensitive disease based on traditional uh, uh, criteria. And at that point, they're generally undergoing um, a, an evaluation for reinduction of, of chemotherapy. Um, many times we also look at these patients as for the potential of reoperating, mm -hmm. 
because we think that may have some benefit. And although at ASCO this year, we'll be providing the first uh, randomized data on surgery in platinum sensitive settings. So more about that to come. Um, after that time point, or in the patients who have a progression during frontline therapy or uh, after, while they're on a platinum, or within a short period of time uh, after platinum, we consider those patients as being relatively chemo insensitive. And, uh, and I use that term rather than just platinum sensitive or resistant because these, these characteristics oftentimes apply across the board for all, uh, all the therapies. But it's interesting that patients that do respond in that setting also have this very high risk of either not responding completely or if they do respond having another recurrence. So this concept of maintenance in the recurrent setting is also kind of the focus of this um, story that we're going to talk about today about PARP inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And then of course we know that there are certain groups of patients that are, that are uh, genetically or genomically mm -hmm. more prone to have that and we're going to discuss that and how the, what the role of BRCA genes are and uh, this aspect of loss of heterozygosity mm -hmm. and all these uh, concepts now that are starting to emerge to identify a broader audience of patients for which these drugs uh, might work. So I'm really excited. We're going to cover a lot of material um, and uh, we've got a great panel of experts that will help walk us through all of this. So welcome and welcome to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so let me start off by um, talking just about what the PARP inhibitors are and I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Laura to just give us an idea of what is a PARP inhibitor? You know, how does it work? Sure. Nuts and yeah. bolts. Thanks. So the PARP inhibitors, uh, poly ADP ribose polymerase inhibitors, and that's what it stands for, and they really target the DNA repair of the cell. And so when we think of what a PARP inhibitor does, we look at cells usually have single-stranded breaks through normal uh, progression, and when we have a single-stranded break, we usually have the PARP enzyme come in, flag the DNA repair enzymes, and thus the DNA is repaired. So what we're hoping to do with these PARP inhibitors is that they block this single-stranded break mechanism, this base excision repair mechanism, and then they force these single-stranded breaks to accumulate to double-stranded DNA breaks. Um, and then when we think about PARP inhibitors and patients that may be more responsive to them, that really comes from the second part of the mechanism. So double-stranded breaks usually go through the homologous recombination pathway to have a repair of those DNA breaks. Um, in patients that have homologous recombination deficiencies, so that would be patients with BRCA mutations or other mutations in that homologous recombination pathway, they may be more susceptible to the PARP inhibitors because those uh, DNA, those double-stranded breaks aren't able to be repaired. So when we think about PARP inhibitors, it's really looking at uh, inhibiting DNA repair. We also tend to think of PARP inhibitors as targeting the PARP1 enzyme specifically and trapping that enzyme on the DNA complex, which causes collapse at the replication fork. So again, the cell isn't able to repair the double-stranded breaks leading ultimately to cell death. Uh, and when we think about that, we think about synthetic lethality, so targeting the base excision repair and the single-stranded breaks of the DNA with this uh, notion that patients that have homologous recombination deficiencies, those two actions together really are what are causing cell death. Great, excellent summary. So how do we identify patients with homologous recombination deficiency? You use that term a lot. And, yeah. and, and I'm curious, is how, do we, how do we know when somebody has that? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, so we do these uh, genetic tests, um, usually on the tumor itself or um, to test for somatic mutations or uh, germline to test for inherited mutations. Mm -hmm. And it's really a genomic sequencing test so that we can identify um, homologous recombination to identify those deficiencies. We look at loss of heterozygosity, so this unmasking of these uh, genes that can cause this DNA repair defects. Mm -hmm. I always, I always like to refer to that as like the smoke and the fire. You yeah. know, the, the, the actual germline and, or the sequencing and somatic, mm -hmm. we can actually identify that. But the loss of heterozygosity is just, we know there's a defect in there, we just yeah. don't know what it is. Right. And, you know, and, at least, and at least we'll talk about it with the data, um, it's probably not necessarily know exactly where it is, it's just right. that it's there. Right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Casey, let me ask you just about this part trapping. What is, mm -hmm. what is um, she mentioned that as a potential uh, mechanism, but how, how, do we, how do we leverage that? Does it matter? 
Well, I think it matter, excuse me, I think it matters a lot depending on the three approved PARP inhibitors that we have, but also two in investigations. Um, in my role, I, I wear many hats in our organization, but one of the hats I wear is the early phase uh, trial director. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to use all five of the agents uh, and obviously the three approved agents. Mm -hmm. The PARP trapping mechanism of the uh, approved agents, niraparib, and actually uh, one of the phase ones I have going right now is with niraparib and everolimus. The toxicity, especially the hematologic toxicity of that agent is much different uh, than a laparib, predominantly because a laparib is a far less weaker mm -hmm. um, PARP trapper than uh, niraparib. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you went in order um, for most uh, PARP trapping ability to least, you would have telazoparib, which is obviously not approved, mm -hmm. followed by probably by niraparib, followed by rucaparib, which mm -hmm. is approved, mm -hmm. then alaparib, and then the least, and I would say probably not tarp, PARP trapping at all, mm -hmm. which would be viliparib. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always um, kind of thought that, uh, you know, it, from the standpoint of the single agent scene, there's such homology, and we'll talk about mm -hmm. the clinical efficacy of uh, the outcomes, it's very much the same story. The, mm -hmm. the, the differential you know, mechanism of action, at least as a single agent, probably doesn't matter very much, but when we start thinking about how we're going to combine these, and we'll get to that yes. at the end, um, it probably does going to, is going to play a role. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's um, a lot that we're um, coming to learn about this. So Judith, let me ask you quickly just about um, uh, these um, drugs with the standpoint of like um, uh, their PK, you know, this, this, you know, mm -hmm. is, are there differences in like their you know, when we use them clinically, I mean, yes. at the doses that they're being used at, so in Raparib at 300, <laughs> Recaparib at 600, Olaparib at 300 on the tablets, does the PK, are they different, or how, yeah. how do we get to the doses we got, you know, that kind of thing? So um, there are differences in the clearance pathways and metabolism, mm -hmm. both Olaparib and Recaparib are hepatically metabolized, where um, Neraparib uh, tends to be um, by carb carboxyl methotransferases, mm -hmm. and so it's more systemic metabolism. Um, and then the clearance is very different, so where you see olaparib and niraparib more renally cleared, um, where rucaparib is more hepatically cleared, so we're seeing a little bit difference. And I think that that may influence some of our dosing modifications in patients with renal insufficiency we're observing in the clinical setting. Mm -hmm. Not as much known on that from the research side, but clinically as we've moved into practice where our patient population has a lot of mm -hmm. renal insufficiency, mm -hmm. that's where we're seeing the patients having more toxicity than anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we need more data in that um, in those patients. And then the bioavailability definitely um, is um, different and that's where you see the differences in the dose in some of the investigational agents as mm -hmm. you're going to see a big drop in our 100 milligram doses, you know, mm -hmm. and down to single digit dosing, and it was, it was impressive to see the differences in the bioavailability. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then the obviously the um, half lives are different with mm -hmm. the rapid having a much longer half life mm -hmm. allows for the once daily dosing, mm -hmm. um, where um, alaparib and rucaparib um, both have um, twice daily dosing. So, and yeah. I think we made a big leap with the alaparib first formulation and the capsules yeah. <laughs> requiring mm -hmm. 18 eight capsules, you know, 60 twice capsules a day, a day yeah. twice yeah. a day. Was is a little bit burdensome to the sure, patients, sure. so I think having the tablet formulation and uh, capsules going to be phased out here, or has been phased out over the past year or so now, that the tablets only require four a day, yeah. so, and having the smaller dosage of the, all the formulations allows us to adjust doses a little mm -hmm. bit easier. That's great, great. So I was going to ask you guys each individually, like, um, since you all work with clinicians, um, and you're right there, shoulder to shoulder. Like, what's the most common in this domain of like how these things work? Their PK, um, the trapping abilities. What's the most common question you get from somebody like me? Laura, I'll put you on the hook first. Sure. <laughs> um, I would say the most common question um, about all of this is just what dose should we start at if we okay. have someone who is maybe not the ideal study patient. Okay. So the patients who are, you know, maybe a little beat up from chemotherapy, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit older, uh, didn't tolerate their uh, platinum mm -hmm. therapy as well as you would hope. So kind of establishing so that initial establishing dose. That initial dose okay. And should we really do the approved dosing? Should we do any dose modifications initially? Okay, good. So, uh, Judith? So I get similar questions to that, mm -hmm. and then also like, what monitoring do we need to be doing? Yeah, okay. So remembering like, when do we have to order CBCs? Mm -hmm. Right. When and how do we adjust the dose? That's been mm -hmm. the big question. So I ordered the CBC. Now, what do you want me to do with got that it. information? Got and it. so Excellent. we do a multidisciplinary management on the um, okay. toxicity. Good. Casey. 
Uh, I would say with the GYN physicians, mm -hmm. it's that question, mm -hmm. which is they use Narapirib a lot. Mm -hmm. And so what weight is the patient? What dose should they start with so I can maintain it? for the least amount of toxicity. Mm -hmm. uh, for the other physicians I work with, I would say in breast and some of the GU mm -hmm. physicians, they're much more interested in the elaparib. How long can I give them a break and they still respond? Mm -hmm. And a lot of those questions, no one knows the answer to. Yeah, great, excellent. Okay, well, why don't we move into some of the clinical efficacy, because obviously there's a lot of utility. You know, we've heard a lot of uh, usage uh, of these drugs. So um, Judith, why don't you just tell us the story of uh, you know, how do we get to this, how do we get to 2018? So, uh, all of it. <laughs> all of it in a nutshell. Two minutes. No, I'm just kidding. So, all of um, the trials. So, what's really exciting is we have, you know, you gave a history of ovarian cancer. We haven't had a lot of new classes of ovarian cancer until recently, mm -hmm. and I would say the past five years we're getting a lot of new options, but the PARP inhibitors were the first agents approved in this maintenance and treatment setting as mm -hmm. an oral agent, which is really exciting for the gynoc arena because we don't have a lot of oral agents. Right. Everything mm -hmm. requires the patient to come to the infusion center. So Alaparib was the first officially mm -hmm. uh, approved PARP inhibitor for the treatment um, in platinum sensitive patients who had had, I think it was at least three prior treatments, mm -hmm. but still platinum sensitive, was the initial FDA approved indication. Germ-9 uh, positive. Yeah, germ germ-9 positive BRCA. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but the PARP arena just exploded thereafter, mm -hmm. where we had Rucaparib approved in December and Naraparib shortly one thereafter. Line earlier, <laughs> Rucaparib, so we got, we got yeah, one line earlier and we added the semantics. Uh, so yeah, so that we more, got more flexibility yeah. with Rucaparib. And then, we had the explosion so, and then the Naraparib was approved for the maintenance setting, mm -hmm. not specifying. Um, germline or somatic BCRA mutations mm -hmm. and technically didn't specify even platinum sensitivity mm -hmm. or resistance mm -hmm. in that um, FDA indication and then Olaparib very recently this past August getting a similar indication for the maintenance setting. Mm -hmm. So um, it's opened a lot of new options for mm -hmm. us. Um, and a lot of questions do come up in clinic as, you know, mm -hmm. how are we going to select which MPARP inhibitor for which patient and that's where um, the toxicity management comes yeah. into play and yeah. where they were gonna, what toxicity will they tolerate better. Yeah, and as you mentioned, we have all three. So Recaparib also approved in April this year. So so, yeah. um, so we've got three agents. We talked about their differences and their similarities. Um, and so, so um, maybe we can drill just a little bit more into the efficacy part of this. So we knew, we found out, it, it is a really interesting story because in 2014, you know, the drug Olaparib was, was actually reviewed by FDA's ODAC and for in the maintenance setting based on one randomized phase two trial we call study 19. And um, it was disapproved. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so, uh, less than six months later, it was approved as a treatment indication. Mm -hmm. And I think it, what, it, what it showed, <clears throat> in, in a, you know, you look in the filing, the briefing document, what they showed was that in these patients who had had three, more, three or more prior lines of therapy that there was a north of 30% response rate. Mm -hmm. But what was really interesting is that is that the sample size that, that they uh, evaluated at 34 or 36% or response rate is that the 95% confidence limit on the lower end was just around 25%. And when they looked at that among all comers, uh, chemotherapy, <clears throat> which they ex anticipated a response rate around 10%. So 25 and 10% are very far away in terms of statistical relevance. So even without a comparator, mm -hmm. they granted this approval in germline positive patients mm -hmm. who had had four, three or more lines of therapy. So <clears throat> shortly thereafter, you know, Recaparib, um, you know, was brought to, it did a very large study, um, uh, two parts, the, the Ariel 2 and study 10, which they combined together and showed that there was this response rate um, in those patients who had, been, who had responded to a platinum um, and um, uh, uh, had a six month window of time. And they showed that there was a, 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 you know, a very good response rate in that, in that um, of north of 50% in that patient population with one line earlier in a platinum sensitive um, right. setting. So um, what's interesting in that, in that paper <clears throat> was that there's the whole other side of the audience they didn't report on, right, mm -hmm. which was all the all comer types. And then this, this idea of this loss of heterozygosity, which we talked about before. And we saw in that data um, that the response rates to, in the LOH positive groups were not quite as high as they were in the, uh, in the PFS, as high mm -hmm. as the, the uh, BRCA mutations, whether it was somatic or germline but it was better than the pure wild types. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so again, nice little treatment indication, but again, another relatively restricted audience, right? These are only somatic and germlines. 
which are probably about you know 25 at the most percent of our of our overall population. Higher in uh, in Washington, in Seattle, because <laughs> Liz has done a Swisher has done a great job of uh, hoarding patients testing. and that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> testing right. everybody. Uh, but then we had these three maintenance trials. So maybe uh, any of you walk me through the uh, what's the, what were the designs of those trials just in general? Because they all three kind of were the same, but then they all three were kind of different. I'll, I can start a little bit. Start and then, you all <laughs> I can jump in at one time. Uh, so I think the interesting thing about the maintenance trials is that... First of all, why don't you just tell us what... The, I, I mentioned what maintenance was, but yes. this, these were called switch maintenance. And some right, people yes. get confused about what that is. I was sure. just going to say, you yeah. should talk about that. Right, yeah. okay, so why don't we say, so what is switch maintenance? Switch maintenance basically is when you have a patient who has a recurrent disease. They get put on their second line of chemotherapy. They have a, at least a partial or a complete response to that chemotherapy. And then after six cycles or so, they get put on a maintenance type therapy to mm -hmm. uh, basically just delay time to next treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and so this switch maintenance versus maintenance. So the, the premise is that instead of continuing someone on chemotherapy mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. months and months and months, you can continue them on a PARP inhibitor. Something different. Something right. different. Switch, a switch. switch to something yes. different, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so these maintenance or switch maintenance trials, I think the interesting thing is they divided the efficacy, and they all did it slightly differently, mm -hmm. but they divided it basically into patients with BRCA mutations, which based on the mechanism we know should respond very well to PARP inhibitor mm -hmm. therapy. Um, and some grouped germline versus everyone else, some grouped right. germline somatic, BRCA mutations versus everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and then they, some of them broke down, you know, patients with germline somatic and these homologous recombination deficiencies. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, trying mm -hmm. to target the patients that mechanistically should respond better to these therapies. Right. Um, and a lot mm -hmm. of what they showed was that patients do have better progression-free survival if they have a genetic uh, target, so a BRCA mutation, um, but there is some efficacy in the all-comer group right. and in the groups where there was no identified mutation. Uh, and so they each report that slightly differently, okay. but I think that's where the interesting clinical use comes in is mm -hmm. that they did show efficacy in patients without any identified marker, but it wasn't nearly as robust as patients with the, mm -hmm. these BRCA. Yeah. And I think the other thing that they started to bring in with all comers is platinum sensitive versus mm -hmm. platinum yeah. resistance yeah. and yeah. reporting the results on that has really opened us to allow to use that maintenance therapy in patients who are platinum resistant as mm -hmm. well yeah. um, and still seeing some response. Again, platinum sensitive responding the most, but including platinum resistance. And it brings up a good question, mm -hmm. I think, is um, I think it was the Niraparib study, um, no, the, Nova the Nova study, Nova study right. uh, mm -hmm. where you know the BRCA mutation can only get you so far. So mm -hmm. in patients who were platinum resistant or refractory, even if they had a BRCA mutation, they really didn't respond any better. And so I think Judith mm -hmm. brings up a good point. It's not only the genetic target, but it's also the platinum sensitivity <laughs> that is mm -hmm. seems to play a larger role in patients mm -hmm. responding to the therapy. Yeah, and I think we also, you look at the differences between the companies. So Clovis, unlike the other two companies, uh, Tesaro and AstraZeneca, went ahead and developed a companion diagnostic mm -hmm. with Foundation Medicine. Mm -hmm. So again, what the perspective you use on the high HRD score, loss of heterozygosity, and how BRCA and all of the other related BRCA genes fits into that discussion, again, again is a, another big point. And how do we move forward from here Mm -hmm. with the new studies that are coming, mm -hmm. um, how does that fit into the paradigm? Right. So one of the uh, interesting findings I, I was uh, impressed by in the Aerial 3 trial, uh, this was the uh, randomized phase 3 trial of switch maintenance using Recaprib, uh, was this subgroup analysis they did in the patients who had partial responses. So as, we, as, as was mentioned, you know, all of these uh, switch maintenance trials, uh, NOVA, SOLA2, study 19 as well, and um, uh, Aerial 3 all had patients who were given a platinum induction therapy, had responded to it, and then after that, um, it, that response, they were randomized to placebo versus drug. And so uh, it, the, although there's a slight difference in the fraction of patients, all of the studies had a significant proportion of patients who had had only a partial response. Mm -hmm. And depending on how the trial was designed, and, and I'm, I'm choosing Aerial 3 because there was no 
um, criteria, unlike NOVA, as to the size of the tumor that could be present at the time of the, uh, at the, time of the randomization. So it was interesting that, um, Casey, that, you know, that they, they studied the response after the response. What, what, what was that about? Well, I think as you know very well, in clinical practice, the, one of the biggest questions is, what do I do with my patients that A, did not get the optimal debulking surgery? What do I do when they have existing disease? And you know, when we're talking second and third line therapy, mm -hmm. some of the patients that have no or very little residual disease left, they do obviously much better. But for patients that have a response to the platinum-based therapy, but at the same time don't have a maximal response, mm -hmm. How do you benefit those patients the most? And it's really interesting in the Ariel 3 data, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, the Recaparib uh, study did show improved benefit in those patients that did have a partial response only. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's an important endpoint as we continue to look at studies in the maintenance slash uh, metastatic or advanced disease setting, but also then how do you use those drugs mm -hmm. right now post surgery in the adjuvant setting, in the right. first line setting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was, it was interesting too because the, uh, you know, the, when they looked at the objective response, so they're using resist criteria now, patients that actually have measurable lesions. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, again, it's a, it's a fraction of, of the total number of patients with partial responses. But again, as we had already mentioned, you know, in the BRCA patients, they got a response, you know, a pretty decent one, 38%. And then in, when they broaden it, you know, kind of the step down procedure, where then they, ought, then they brought in the LOH patients, they saw more responses. And then obviously in the wild type population, they saw, you know, um, a few additional responses. So overall, they all had these objective responses. Mm -hmm after they had already had platinum. So right. it kind of talks a little bit about to the mechanism of these drugs and whether or not there's just direct overlap with platinum sensitivity and PERP sensitivity. And that's a whole other thing we can get into, <laughs> right. which I know you guys know very well. But um, I think that, um, you know, that was just kind of interesting to see that there's this continued um, potential for objective response. And that's probably why these drugs you know, work in this switch maintenance setting since so many patients don't have complete responses mm -hmm. after platinum um, when they have uh, platinum sensitive recurrent disease treated with that, that disease. So I asked you this, that question, the provocative question about what's the most common, you know, question you guys get. Um, and I think it just, it raises this issue, um, I think particularly among clinicians that have, don't have a lot of experience with this class of drug. Um, you know, when we give chemo, if you change to a different chemo, we kind of know, well, it's got, you know, mild suppression and non-hemologic toxicities. And we know how to kind of deal with that because we've done with it over and over again. Now we got this PARP inhibitor, different mechanism of action. I'm not really sure exactly how to use it, but, um, you know, we try. And so you said that, uh, or you said that, uh, you know, sometimes they ask, what's the starting dose? Well, doesn't the FDA know what's best for us? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, what do we see is the most, why don't you start us off and just, what is the sure. most common side effect that you see with this class of drug, the way we use it? Sure. So, uh, some of the most common that I think the patients really feel yeah. um, is early nausea. Um, mm -hmm. So, these are patients who often have baseline nausea because of their disease in the abdomen, they've um, been exposed to other chemo, uh, they're female patients, so they tend to just have nausea because of their disease. And then uh, these PARP inhibitors across the board uh, all cause pretty significant nausea. It's relatively low grade, but enough that we should be giving pre-medications for them. Uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you We usually recommend? do a serotonin antagonist uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. daily. Uh, and, the good thing is, by about month two, that nausea is much better. Mm -hmm. kind of but um, you know, patients really feel that nausea, and it can be really distressing. Mm -hmm. And then we see quite a bit of fatigue mm -hmm. as well, um, to the point where patients, you know, struggle to get out of bed, where they were previously very active, and you know, they feel pretty good on their chemotherapy, and then we give them this maintenance therapy, and it really uh, <laughs> knocks their energy out. And yeah. so those are uh, two of the the bigger ones that we see that mm -hmm. patients really feel and mm -hmm. can impact them. Judith, from the from mm -hmm. uh, the laboratory side of things. How, what kind of uh, you know, uh, abnormalities do we see kind of just with our routine use? So what's contributing to the fatigue is we do see a lot of anemia, anemia. Mm -hmm. um, and um, thrombocytopenia with niraparib. Mm -hmm. Um, with the anemia, the, we try to be a little bit more proactive in making sure they're on a multivitamin with iron to mm -hmm. kind of give them that support at baseline. Um, the thrombocytopenia, you know, there's nothing we can do to prevent it, mm -hmm. um, but more close management and monitoring. Mm -hmm. And then 
you know, when we have patients starting with a platelet count of 300,000 and it drops to 150,000, it's not necessarily thrombocytopenia, but we saw that significant change in a week, and so we'll make dose modifications. Mm -hmm. um, there was some preliminary data suggesting that, you know, based on the patient's age or weight or thrombo um, platelet count, mm -hmm. that that was going to be predictive of who should, you know, be more, who would be more susceptible to thrombocytopenia, mm -hmm. but I have to be honest, in the clinical setting, those haven't panned out. The patients that I've had had grade mm -hmm. four thrombocytopenia were young, non-obese, mm -hmm. or you know, actually obese. I'm sorry, they mm -hmm. were ob overweight, mm -hmm. maybe not obese, and had phenomenal baseline thrombocytopenia uh, platelet, platelet counts, counts yeah. of like 300,000 yeah. and going down to six. And so it's, um, I think, we need more data in that arena. I think uh -huh. it was a clinical trial data set where we have our best patients mm -hmm. on clinical trials, and I was like, I don't know if that was necessarily the best predictive markers mm -hmm. when you go to clinical practice. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where we've been looking and seeing renal function and um, albumin, yeah, baseline yeah, albumin, because it's highly, all three are highly protein bound. Yeah. So uh -huh. yeah, that's something, again, in the gynecologic oncology setting, not something usually we really pay a lot of attention to more from a nutrition aspect versus we don't use a lot of oral mm -hmm. agents. So now it's like, oh wait, we're using oral agents. We need to start thinking about bioavailability. We need to start thinking about changes yeah. in free fraction. Right. Mm -hmm. So Casey, the um, uh, so anything else uh, kind of uh, side effect wise that, we, that <clears throat> comes to your attention? Yeah, I would say in the patients, since I've been fortunate enough to p treat patients for a long time on some of these agents, yeah. mm -hmm. um, cardiotoxicity, especially hypertension mm -hmm. with niraparib actually crops up more than you would uh, care to guess. Mm -hmm. We have patients that have well-controlled blood pressure at baseline, and then all of a sudden they're in the 170, 180 systolic, mm -hmm. and you're like, wow, that's a big change. Yeah. Um, and also tachycardia, which I'm also not used to seeing in mm -hmm. these otherwise relatively low heart rate patients and yeah. then all of a sudden they come in with heart rates that are quite high. Yeah. Uh, Long-term myelodysplastic syndrome development is also mm -hmm. something that we've seen. It's not hugely prevalent, but it does happen. Yeah. That's a good point. I think, um, you know, we, it's your hard to get data on that because it's such a low frequency in the background and everybody's already had chemo. Right. Yeah. So you never know what, who did what. Yeah. But, you know, I was kind of encouraged seeing the NOVA data that, uh, you know, the rate was, was almost identical in the two arms, control versus, and there was a lot, a lot of exposure there. So, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see how that sorts out more, right. but, yeah, we've all seen it. And, <laughs> yeah. and of course, the NCI and, and FDA are very attuned to seeing yes. these cases, so they're all reportable. But um, yeah, it's it's hard to know what, what who's contributing yeah. most. Especially to it. since they've already had platinum, and right? And, and right. some of them are quite it, a yeah. bit of platinum, sure, and so sure. it's Absolutely. hard. Absolutely. So we talked a little bit about these toxicities that come up, and so I want to let me go back to the nausea really quickly because. Um, because I've seen it, and I'm sure you guys have too, that sometimes the, the serotonin antagonists don't really work. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you use as your kind of go-to after that? I mean, we typically, you know, we'll have them have compazine on hand yeah. or yeah. procolparazine on hand. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of anticipatory nausea and vomiting in this yeah. patient population. They know it's chemo. They mm -hmm. know they're taking mm -hmm. it every day. So um, occasionally we'll use a benzodiazepine like lorazepam um, in those patients that, you know, are nauseous before mm -hmm. they even take anything. Mm -hmm. But um, we try to, you know, base it on the clinical experience the patients had to date, whether mm -hmm. or not we're going to schedule antiemetics versus um, with the once daily dosing with Neuroparib, we tell them to take it at bedtime, so okay. that way that they sleep through that right. initial nausea feeling, mm -hmm. and that seemed to resolve not needing antiemetics in that, those patients. Um, the twice daily, you know, sometimes taking with a little food and, you know, using your normal, like, uh, smaller meals and right. trying to um, uh, manage it so that... Right. We're not adding an additional cost of having um, a continuous on Dantotron yeah. on top of the um, PARP inhibitor regimen. Right, right. So um, we talked a little bit about like when to anticipate these side effects, and I think Laura, I think you mentioned that you know after that first month or two months, mm -hmm. it kind of like goes into the background. Mm -hmm. um, what about um, creatinine? I have a special <laughs> place in my heart for creatinine. Me too. So, yeah, so. So, Judith, tell, me, tell us a little about the creatinine experience. So, um, well, one thing is you do need to be monitoring renal function. Yeah, uh -huh. And so I would say not just um, looking at what the creatinine is, because they could have a normal creatinine, and based mm -hmm. on the patient, still have renal insufficiency. So 
Olaparib does have specific guidelines for dose adjusting, mm -hmm. and um, hopefully Norepirib will in the near future. Um, Rucaparib, it doesn't seem to have as much renal elimination, so it's, mm -hmm. um, so those patients that you have significant renal insufficiency to start with, that may be a better PARP inhibitor for that patient. And mm -hmm. I think that's where we're gonna, in the clinic, start thinking about, um, but you do need to monitor because over time um, it can, change and it changes based on the patient's hydration status and progression of disease as well. Yeah, we've, um, you know, we've looked at this because, you know, we participate in a lot of um, clinical trials where we were monitoring this stuff and we, um, so we know that all of them do interfere with the creatinine transporters and so some, I was always concerned as to whether or not we were, what we were seeing as creatinine elevations was renal dysfunction, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. So um, we, we have um, a series of patients where we've sent them for renal function studies to actually do a measured GFR as opposed to mm -hmm. a calculated one, because with mm -hmm. elevated creatinine, um, due to you know um, just interference with the transporters as as opposed to real kidney injury, and we found um, most of the time it was just a false elevation, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But it's it's true that hydration does seem to even impact the, um, and maybe this is just the saturation in kinetics. But we do find that hydration can actually lower creatinines, even if it's only artificial, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so maybe we just wash it yeah. away or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I always, I always try to recommend to um, clinicians and investigators that if they do see creatinine bump, and we do see a pretty uh, nice one uh, on the, in the uh, Aerial 3 study that we calculated this over time, that, um, that they actually know whether or not it's real kidney injury, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, too, because that's mm -hmm. really super important, as opposed to what's a false elevation, because mm -hmm. uh, that would um, affect how we might do the dose adjustments and such. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, another thing I also uh, get in the clinic is uh, patients will complain of uh, sleeplessness. Mm -hmm. Insomnia. Mm -hmm. yeah, insomnia. Insomnia. What do you guys think of that? Uh, I think it's unfortunate or, that we knock them down with fatigue and then they can't fall asleep <laughs> at night, right. so it's kind of unfair. Yeah. Um, but we do have quite a few patients uh, who report insomnia, and um, we really struggle with that. And so sometimes, um, as far as management, we try not to give sleep aids, but I think it's important just to mm -hmm. let patients know that that is a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and either holding therapy or doing a dose reduction. I think a lot of times just setting up patients to have the right expectations mm -hmm. to know what is gonna happen, um, mm -hmm. that they can better prepare themselves, mm -hmm. um, makes the therapy more successful. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we see a lot of insomnia. And I don't necessarily have a good mm -hmm. suggestion other than a potential dosing break. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, Susan, I was giving a talk someplace and um, uh, on this and I was going through my usual you know, toxicity slides mm -hmm. and all that of all three drugs and, you know, where the similarities are, where they're a little different. Um, and we've covered a lot of that here today. Um, and then I got done with my talk and I said, you know, they have this issue with insomnia. We don't really know how to, why it happens, blah, blah, blah. So this postdoc comes out of the audience. He's like, that's <laughs> open. And he, and, he, and he sent me, uh, and he was telling me about some work that he had been doing. And he sent me a couple papers. And it was really fascinating um, that... Um, PARP is, um, PARP-1 at least, seems to be responsible in part for the um, metabolic processes mm -hmm. that follow a circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. oh, and so PARP inhibition seems to potentially disrupt those par processes mm -hmm. that are linked to circadian processes, which mm -hmm. makes me think about insomnia as a potential yeah, um, side effect and a mechanism of action. It's really mm -hmm. fascinating. Of course. Fascinating. So yeah, always learn. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. That's really interesting. So really, really cool. So, and I do believe it is, it is tricky to deal with. And mm -hmm. I think some, for some people, it is really um, impactful mm -hmm. uh, in a way that, you know, we would consider, say, mild suppression is impactful mm -hmm. right. uh, yes. to a patient. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the so, patients are feeling better yeah. at that point. Yeah, They've yeah. been wiped out by chemo, the surgery, mm -hmm. and the whole uh, deal, whatever they've had in their therapeutic um, cascade of events. And then mm -hmm. they start feeling better. They're on oral therapy. They're at home. Um, yeah. And then they're stuck with this. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's where it kind of gets back to setting clear expectations yeah. because I, I do think there's a perception like this is oral. Yeah, so this is less toxic. <laughs> right. yeah. and, and from the clinician and the patient's perspective, they both think, oh, I'm, I'm going to go home on oral chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. This is going to be better tolerated. And I have heard many times that they're told that it'll be better tolerated. Mm -hmm. And then I come in and no, actually not. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. Actually, this does right. have similar toxicities that we have seen with some of So um, I think setting the expectations lets the patient mentally mm -hmm. manage it a little bit better and then be okay with 
not expecting to feel like a superstar. Yeah, right. I think um, kind of maybe just to close the loop on this, I think um, some other uncommon toxicities we've seen uh, with our experience with it has been like pneumonitis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's always tricky, um, especially if you're looking at combinations <laughs> with the right. yeah. I was going to say, well, who's I haven't seen that, that with the single yeah, agent, but yeah, I have no. the combination. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, and how we manage those um, can be, uh, it just is tricky and takes some, some attention. And then we've also seen some interesting skin rashes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as an unusual side effects. I got some good pictures I use in every talk, probably in one patient, but <laughs> she uses her all over the place. Um, but uh, we've seen uh, those types of uh, adverse events as well. So, but in general, I think, um, I think our collective experience has been that, um, you know, you monitor, you can't just like treat the patient and forget about it, you know, and we gotta pay mm -hmm. attention to their symptoms early on. Mm -hmm. We know that sometimes those first two months are the most difficult to get mm -hmm. through, but once they're through, and some patients just sail for months and years yes. on treatment. And I know that um, some of the earliest trials uh, with Elaborate, there are patients still on those trials of mm -hmm. more than five and six years uh, uh, continuous dosage. Um, so new therapy, um, new mechanism of action, um, particular, uh, potentially large audience of patients for which this drug is working, mm -hmm. uh, clinical mm -hmm. evidence of efficacy in the switch maintenance setting and in, in, in select patient groups mm -hmm. in the recurrent setting um, with measurable disease. Um, and uh, so uh, where are we going? Casey, where, where are we going with this stuff? Well, I think What's it's next? a great question. So the, I, I'd throw it back to you in a minute, but you know, <laughs> I said it first. <laughs> MD, MD Anderson. I mean, you have the plethora of trials in these uh -huh. uh, in these women and in these patients, and I think it's important to look where does it fit in the cascade of in the beginning or at the end, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere in the middle. And because mm -hmm. obviously we've talked a, a long time about prior platinum therapy and now mm -hmm. PARPs after. Well, what do we? What happens when we move it in the beginning? Mm -hmm. and so what we've discussed mm -hmm. is. Does any of this data hold? Mm -hmm. um, because we're going to use it in the beginning in the future. Number two, how do you combine it, or do you combine it with immunotherapy, PI3K inhibitors, or TARC12 inhibitors, or mm -hmm. things that are coming? And also, how do you use it with chemotherapy? Mm -hmm. Like it's done in breast cancer and other diseases, what do you do with carbotaxol and a PARP? And mm -hmm. can you use all of the agents? Mm -hmm because of the hematologic overlap and the toxicity? Is Olaparib the best choice in those patients? Can yeah. you use uh, Niraparib, et cetera? And then also uh, the, the schedule. Can you sequence? Mm -hmm. How do you give mm -hmm. the drugs in what order? Right. And I think we're working out all those questions, but it's gonna be interesting to mm -hmm. see. I'm most interested in our group um, in the PI3K uh, mm -hmm. uh, treatments plus uh, PARP inhibitors. We've mm -hmm. shown a lot of synergy data mm -hmm. and have had great successes, quite frankly, in mm -hmm. those patients. Mm -hmm. And also, where does it fit with immunotherapeutics? And I don't mean just checkpoint inhibitors. Yeah, I mean right. the whole mm -hmm. cascade of uh, immunotherapeutics coming. Yeah, I think it's quite exciting there. Yeah, you know, currently, um, as you mentioned, you know, there was um, uh, a trial uh, initially done at mid OZA um, study 42, which was giving Pactax caroplatinum with Elaparib, mm -hmm. and, and basically all the drugs needed to be reduced mm -hmm. in dose because of the myelosuppression. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, when you look at that, the, the PFS curves there, you see between the two cohorts in that randomized trial, uh, there's nothing until after um, the part, until they go on to the maintenance piece. So it wasn't clear that there was an augmentation of the chemotherapy effect, at least during that part of the trial. Um, Viliparib right now, as you mentioned, is, is one of the uh, weaker uh, PARP trappers, um, uh, is being given with uh, chemotherapy in the frontline setting followed by maintenance, uh, GOG3005, which is, has finished its accrual. So, um, you know, as those events come in, we'll have some information about that. Uh, Solo One and Prima are two trials that are looking at Elaparib and Neuraparib as primary maintenance. Mm -hmm. So those trials are, um, uh, will, are expected to report pretty soon. Um, and then uh, uh, because everybody is expecting those, <laughs> we all have a pile of trials that are fitting into that primary maintenance mm -hmm. space, which as I mentioned is looking at um, uh, against placebo, for instance, PARP alone, IO alone, AI, uh, angiogenesis inhibi inhibition alone. Uh, and then the combinations of each of those mm -hmm. doublets and then one trial with the triplet. Mm -hmm. yep. So, so uh, and then of course in the recurrent setting, um, there is a lot of interest at looking at these novel combinations, trying to mm -hmm. capitalize. You mentioned PI3 Kennedy's pathway. Uh, basically everything I just mentioned for, for mm -hmm. the maintenance mm -hmm. setting is gonna be right, done in exactly. the recurrent setting. And yes. so, um, and I do think that, um, uh, that that does address the question about the augmentation of PARP response. Mm -hmm. So, um, with all of that happening, uh, 
as you mentioned, we're going to have a whole bunch of patients in the real near future who've had prior PARP. But they either got it because they got it on maintenance or they got it and they progressed on it. And so that's a whole other group of patients we're going to have to deal with very rapidly. As you said, a lot of the trials that we're dealing, that have led to the approvals, if they've received a PARP before, they would have not been eligible for those trials. So the question of relevancy of those data in patients who've been previously exposed is going to be tricky. So um, anybody, um, uh, Judith, how, why does PARP resistance happen? Well, I think, I mean, that's the um, holy grail of, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of, of drug resistance itself. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, with the um, exposure to the PARP inhibitors, um, it's the drug exposure then leads to uh, the tumor to automatically learn and, or I hate to work around, sound, work around yeah. and, and come up with alternative mechanisms right. to overcome it. Um, and, you know, that's where with oral therapy, non-compliance is going to be an, a huge mm -hmm. issue. And that's something that has been a challenge across oncology pharmacy. Mm -hmm. How do we improve compliance? And I think when the drug resistance arena, that's like going to be a key factor sure, sure. Um, in making sure that mm -hmm. they don't have a increased um, non-compliance to mm -hmm. tease the exposure and increase those mechanisms before me. I do um, work a lot with modulation resistance, uh -huh. and I know we've worked with mechanisms to modulate um, platinum resistance, and so, of course, that's where we're kind of going to go so, to next in yeah. our lab and say, okay, well, can we modulate part and resistance in the same mm -hmm. um, arena? And coming up with an oral way of doing that would be um, advantageous mm -hmm. patient, yeah. because the, the drugs mm -hmm. themselves have so much activity, so if we can downregulate those pathways, um, mm -hmm. By adding it with another reg regimen, would be great. Laura, you, you guys, have, I know, have worked a lot on this in, yeah, in your place too. I yeah, I think we've also seen in patients with um, BRC mutations that after PARP therapy, they lose that and they go, they kind of reverse back to not having a BRC mutation. And so, in, in effect, yeah. you lose your target. And yeah. um, we've seen patients that. Um, you know, responded to Olaparib or whatever PARP inhibitor, mm -hmm. and then after a couple months, they stop responding, and um, in effect, we've lost that target. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've talked about could you give a PARP inhibitor after a PARP inhibitor, and if it's that type of um, mechanism, mechanism yeah, of resistant, would. I think it's really hard, and I don't think you that's, expect, mm, really it may not be successful. Yeah. So I think, yeah, that mm -hmm. brings up a really good point mm -hmm. of probably understanding what the resistance is, and it may vary by patient. Yeah, I think the last report mm -hmm. I saw, there's like 10 mechanisms of resistance that have been described. <laughs> One of which is what Judith mentioned, is loss of target, so mm -hmm. PARP is gone. Mm -hmm. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's, you know, there's nothing to inhibit. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the other thing I think that's pretty cool about this whole space is that, you know, we attribute BRCA mutation with HRD, mm -hmm. but we don't measure HRD, right? right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's some reports now that suggest that there are um, tumors that are BRCA mutation but have compliance right. in their HR machinery. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that may be regulated by things like microRNA. So, there's, it's, it's, it's certainly like, it's one of those things where you, the more you dig, <coughs> the more you uncover, you're like, yeah. oh my gosh, this is way more complicated yeah. <laughs> than I thought it was. But it, you know, in, in that in, in in that space, though, you know, when we look at the DNA repair pathway, um, there's continuous development of new drugs mm -hmm. based on all of those points. And to this point about mm -hmm. these combinations, right. that you know, for instance, combining PARP with an ATR inhibitor. Seems I was just going to mention, yeah, that yes. and we one and all and these ATM inhibitors ATM, that are coming, check one two, right. all mm -hmm. these things. You know, are new um, you know ideas that that you know could be really relevant in that part pre-exposed or even more so part um, reversion type mm -hmm. of uh, or BRCA you know reversion type mm -hmm. case. So really exciting area. Yeah. So um, uh, you know we've covered a lot of material. <laughs> it's a lot to digest, but I think that you know because this is a, a new a new space and people are gaining more experience with it. I think these questions. The information you guys have provided today are quite helpful to um, to our audience and to um, clinicians that are um, dealing with this on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. and And understanding the mechanisms and the resistance issues provide us that great opportunity of moving forward. And as you mentioned, not just in ovary, but we're talking in, in not it's, just in gen, right? We're yeah. in yeah. cervix exactly. and GY and, and mitral already on the board, but now we've got prostate and breast. and breast and just lung, pancreatic lung cancer. And pancreatic. Pancreatic. Yeah. Um, so, a uh, yeah. lot, of, lot of great future for this class of drugs. So I'd like to uh, 
leave the parting shot to my co-hosts. Uh, and let me start with you, Casey. Any last words for us? Oh, well, again, thank you for uh, the invitation to be on the panel. And I learned a lot today, especially from you and my uh, colleagues. And I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Judith? Well, thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. I really enjoyed our discussion about the PARP inhibitors, where we're using them in clinical practice, and our future research. It sounds really exciting. Thank you. Laura? Thanks. It has been a pleasure for me to be in this panel as well, and I think it's been exciting to hear not only how we're doing things uh, similarly, but how we're doing things differently, and I think we can take a lot of best practices for the management of our patients on these therapies. Thanks again. Good. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this uh, roundtable discussion of PARP inhibitors uh, in ovarian cancer.